Greetings everybody and welcome to our service this morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord and even better to see you all here with us. We pray that as the schools have gone back this week that you are uh, getting back into the, the new year and into the routine of things that happen in the year. Um, we just want to welcome you to our service as well as those who are joining us online. Um, we hope that you feel at home as we worship together. Friends, um, just a few notices on our uh, intimations this morning. Um, just to say that um, we have a scheduled meeting for our session to meet on Tuesday, but um, I haven't spoken to the session yet, but I'm going to ask them to delay that by a week. Um, we have um, our um, parents' evening on Tuesday, so I'm sure that you'll see that again in next week's brochure. It's just a delay. And then um, on the back, you'll see there's a couple of appeals uh, for different causes. The first is the Childhood Cancer Fund Foundation of South Africa, CHOC. If you'd like to donate any uh, crocheted blankets, baby clothes, food items, or knitted teddies, you can do so. Uh, you can pop them for the time being into the basket here at the front, and then we will split up and sort out, and then Lorraine is going to arrange for them to get where they need to go. And then uh, the last couple of years, we've collected stationery for the children that we support at Norwood Primary. Uh, we like to just give them a little bit of stationery just to start the year. Um, the children that we feed our sandwiches is about 40 children and that's and um, usually from households that are struggling. So buying stationery is a huge expense at the beginning of the year and often uh, children come to school and they haven't got pens and pencils and crayons and things like that to start the year. And so we like to just give them something just to get them on their way and um, uh, that kind of thing. So we, we have done a, a collection already. I, um, towards the end of last year, went into CNA at uh, Balfour Park and they were closing down and they had 50% of everything. So I bought a whole whack of stationery. So, but I think we're still outstanding for about 10 sets of the different things. So we're offering you an opportunity to either bring stationery, uh, put a few things together and, and, and donate that to us, or if you are able then and you want to reimburse the church for that expense that, that we've already uh, laid out for, you're welcome to do so, is to make a donation towards that. But we'd really love to give each of our children uh, just a little bit of stationery to start the year. We're also just waiting to hear from the school about when we will start to do sandwiches and that. So we will keep you posted. As soon as we hear, we will let you know and put up a list. And then we continue to support um, those in our congregation who struggle with food and with resources and that. So if you can make any donations of the list that is provided for there, you're welcome to do so. If you'd like to make a monetary donation, you're also welcome to do so. And then there is Faith for Daily Living. For those of you who may have missed uh, the January, February edition, it is at the back there. You're welcome to take some, even take some for those others who subscribe to that. And then we have two birthdays in the week. We've got uh, Denon Smith, who's celebrating on the 18th of January. That's on Tuesday. And then we have Jill Drake, who is celebrating on the 22nd of January. And then just to take note of those who we've been praying for, they are on the list there. If you have any feedback that you would like to filter back to us so we can adjust the list, please don't hesitate to contact us at the office or if there's somebody you'd like to add to that list so that we can remember them as we do our daily and weekly prayers, please uh, feel free to contact the office. Friends, as we find ourselves in this new year, we, um, I was having a look at the, the calendar for the year and I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look at the calendar, but you'll notice that Easter is on the slightly later side. It's um, in the middle of um, April, and so um, our season of Lent is also a little bit delayed, so we'll only start Lent in March. And so we have this longer time 
of Epiphany, which is where we are right now, um, where the, we look at the, the purposes of God as he reveals himself in creation. And as you will know, this, this morning we are going to be looking at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of John as he kicks it off. But as we gather together for worship, we have a responsive call to worship this morning, and I'm going to ask you to reply with the short sentence that is in the bold lettering that says all. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Restore us, O Lord. Darkness shall cover the earth, the thick darkness the, the thick darkness, the peoples. Renew us, O Lord. But the Lord will arise upon you, and God's glory will appear over you. Restore and renew us, O Lord. We're going to open in a word of prayer. Come, let us pray. We thank you, our Heavenly Father. Because by your divine power, you have given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all these by coming to know you, our Lord Jesus, the one who called us to himself, the one who is inviting us to be part of his family, this family. Lord, we thank you for the great and precious promises you have given to us, which enable us to share in your divine nature. Lord, we enter this new year Reminded of your faithfulness of the past year and the past years of our lives. And although we come before you with uncertainty more so than in previous years, Lord, help us to put our hands into yours. And to trust you for whatever the year might hold. Listen to these words of confession. We confess our Heavenly Father we have neglected your spirit. And the gifts of your spirit. We have depended wholly on our own strength concluding that we can successfully stand against the evil one by relying on the arm of our flesh, on our own knowledge and skills. But we have continually failed you. We have failed to listen to you. Instead, we have listened to the world and followed its dictates and directions. We failed to live as light and salt of the earth. We have failed to preserve it and dispel its darkness. Because of our sinful lifestyle, we struggle to reflect your light in the world. We have lost our saltiness. We've lost our influence. Have mercy on us, dear Lord. Forgive our neglect and confusion of heart. Cleanse us with the blood for which you shed for us at Calvary. Forgive us, O Lord. Restore and renew us. Through your Spirit. And through your presence in our lives. For we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. 
Friends, we're going to worship together as we sing 10,000 Reasons.
Friends, our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. John. We're going to be reading from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, The mother of Jesus said to him, We have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk but you have kept the good wine until now Jesus did this the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. May God bless the hearing of his word to us today. I wonder how your 2022 has started off. Has it been a good start? Has it been a shaky start? Is it too early to tell what the start is going to be like. How many of you began the new year with some resolutions? I feel like resolutions are a dying art. Am I wrong? Hey? I feel like when we were kids, it was a big deal to think of New Year's resolutions. And at the beginning of the year, there would be always a conversation about what were your New Year's resolutions? I heard on the radio, one of the radio presenters said, no, 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 Um, scientists and researchers have shown that you shouldn't make New Year's resolutions because 98% of us or some ridiculous percentage of us fail at them. We never see them through. But she was advocating to say we should make New Year's goals. I'm not sure how the word changing there made a difference, but that's how uh, she was advocating for us to make New Year's goals. How we start things is important. How we start things things is important because often it gives us an indication about how we're going to carry on things and how we will end things. We all want to make a first good impression, whether that is in a new relationship or in a new friendship or in a new job or if you start at a new church. 
or a new school. We all want to make a good first impression. And like we've said before, there are there is that saying that says first impressions last. It's difficult to begin something with a bad first impression to debunk that and to change it into something that is good. So as we are on the beginning of the new year and perhaps we're hesitant to make any good impressions or good goals or good New Year's resolutions because we've had a turbulent two years that we feel a little reticent. We still want to have a good impression. And this morning, as we look at our scriptures, we're right at the beginning of the Gospel of John. And if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, you'll know that that first chapter is that poetic theology chapter. The light and the dark and the darkness has never put it out and the, the, the word was with God and is God and all of those kinds of things. So John begins his Gospel by setting the scene with this highly theological, poetic start to his gospel. But then when we find ourselves in this chapter 2, we find ourselves at the start of Jesus' ministry. Now we've spoken about this before because each of the gospel writers start Jesus' ministry in different ways. Which is interesting, because you think that they would all start it in the same way. But remember that the writers are writing after the death of Jesus, as they look back onto Jesus' life. And those writers are writing with a specific audience in mind. And so that influences the kinds of things they include in their writings, as well as the start, the middle, and the end of the Gospels. For John, John is our sign man. He's got seven signs in his Gospel that lead and link in between the other things around the gospel. And this, today's reading, is the first of the signs. It's the beginning of John's gospel telling the story of Jesus' life. I came across a commentator, one of my favorite ones, David Luce, and he describes how all the others are so different to John's beginning. And he says these words. In Mark, the first thing Jesus does as his first act of being the Messiah, of being Jesus, is cast out an unclean spirit. That's the first thing that happens in Mark, or Mark tells us Jesus does. He casts out an unclean spirit, announcing his intention to stand against all that would keep the children of God from abundant life. Interesting. Mark's whole gospel follows that line. All the things that are keeping us from having a full life in Jesus, Mark highlights as the work Jesus does. In Matthew, it's different. And the first major event of Matthew's gospel, talking about Jesus' public ministry, is his Sermon on the Mount, where he teaches the crowds from the mountain, and he seems to come across as one who is like Moses, who brought down the word, the instructions, of the Lord. And again, if you go back and you read the Gospel of Matthew, 
you can see threads of those that same theme being carried through teachings about the life of living the life with God then we get Luke Jesus first preaches in the Gospel of Luke if you can remember Jesus goes to the synagogue and he sits in the synagogue and then he gets handed a role a script and it is the words from Isaiah and in there it talks about announcing his intention to heal to feed and release the captives and bring good news to the poor you see how the gospel writers have intentionally chosen something that sets their gospel apart from the others a theme which they can draw and pull into all the different acts that will come after this first one first things matter and then we get the gospel of John John tells us Jesus goes to a wedding when you think about it in light of the other three gospels starts going to a wedding sounds rather bizarre Jesus goes to a wedding as I was contemplating this through the week and thinking about first things and starting off and that and looking at the different gospels and how they carry that th theme through and how John is so different I've decided that I actually like John the most in his starting off at a wedding you know why because I think that we spiritualize Jesus into the Messiah so much we focus so much on being God's son that we forget that he was human we forget that he was a man we forget that he was part of a family we forget that he was part of a community we forget that he would have attended weddings and funerals and celebrations and birthdays and all of those things we forget and I feel like the beginning of John's gospel is a reminder that that Jesus is fully human he's just a guest at a wedding I wonder if you can remember for those of you who are married your wedding can you remember your wedding I was thinking about my wedding we got married in the in the old church and then we went to the reception which was at the Balalaika Hotel afterwards and we had a big function room that had those round tables you see and I giggled to myself as I thought through what it would have been like to look out from the front table at your wedding and to see Jesus sitting at one of those big round tables you know with the flower centerpieces maybe he's sipping a little bit of champagne you know he's got a plate of food from the buffet he's talking to the other guests that are there perhaps when you think of Jesus at your wedding you would be worried about Uncle Douglas you know when he's had a few too many and then he starts talking to Jesus about some weird and wonderful thing or maybe you'd be afraid of Auntie Muriel who would have come up and wanted to regale stories about how you were a, a little pigtailed girl ran around naked in the garden through the sprinkler and you would just be, feel so embarrassed <coughs> Jesus is at a wedding. That's where he is. He's, he's living an ordinary life in an ordinary place. 
and, and Mary asking Jesus to intervene when there's a problem seems to indicate to us that this is actually a family wedding. This is family of theirs. You see, as much as I try to imagine what running out of wine or drinks or whatever at my wedding would have been like, it would have been embarrassing. It, it maybe wouldn't have been nice. It would have been embarrassment on the hotel, I don't know, or embarrassment on us if we didn't have enough money to pay for it or something like that. But back in the day, it was so much more than just an embarrassment. Because wine and providing for your guests and bearing in mind that these weddings went over a whole week, a whole week of wedding. Hey? Can you imagine that? Where people came in and out and congratulated and sat down and had food with you and drink and all of that kind of thing. So it went on for this extended amount of time. But the symbolism of the wine and having enough to provide for your guests for that entire time talked about how blessed your marriage was going to be. It's like you, you would run out of blessing. Your marriage would become a curse. You know how we talked about first things, first impressions, starting things off? Well, this marriage would have started off on the wrong foot. The community would have probably talked about how that wedding... Do you remember so-and-so and so-and-so when they, got, they, they ran out of wine? People would have, would have watched that marriage to, to wonder whether they could go the distance. It would have been a difficult first impression to get rid of as their lives went on. So it was more than just the little bit of embarrassment that there wasn't enough wine. It spoke about the blessings of that, having that. It would have been disastrous for them. And then we have this conversation between Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's not named Mary in any of the scripts, but the mother of Jesus approaches him and says, we need to do something. And Jesus is reluctant. He's reluctant to do something. Because he knows that once he does this, once he gets involved in this, and he does the miracle, his days are numbered. The clock begins to tick. Hence his response to say, Woman, my hour has not yet come. I'm not sure that I, I want to begin this because once I begin it, it's going to be a roller coaster of all sorts of things. Now, whatever happens between the two of them, he does it. Now, we're told that there are six clay jars, 20 to 30 gallons of wine. I mean, I don't know how many people they were having at this wedding, but that sounds like a lot of wine. A lot, a lot of wine. So he doesn't just say, fill a couple of one or two of them. He tells them to... Full six of them. Full six of them. And of course we know that he doesn't just change the water into wine, average wine. He changes it into this vintage, <laughs> vintage wine. But it is worth noting here, and it does say in the scripture, that these jars are ritual washing jars. Jewish ritual washing jars. Now for us, it's, it's just information. But remember that the first audience hearing this, it would have meant something to them. Why? Well, the ritual cleaning jars were those jars that they would have washed your hands and feet to make you clean, to be participate in a meal, clean before the Lord, clean, cleanliness, ceremonial washing. That's what the jars were. Now there's symbolism that
that Jesus then takes those same jars and uses them, not with water, but suddenly they have wine. And it's not for cleaning the outside, but it is something that will go inside. See what I'm hearing? The first audience would have already been privy to knowing that Last Supper where Jesus takes the wine and says, This is the covenant in my blood. Symbolism of the wine being Jesus himself. Cleansing us from our sins. They would have known that as they heard it. And there would have been a connection for them to say that the old ritualistic ceremonial washing of hands and feet, that era has come to an end. And Jesus is going to create wine, blood. He's going to suffer on the cross. And that is going to cleanse us on the inside. It is going to produce new hearts and new lives. Let's get to the two important parts. The abundance of wine and the quality. Jesus indicates here that it is so much of something wonderful. Why? Why does Jesus create so much of something of good quality? I think there, there's an indication for that in the previous chapter. In chapter 1, verse 16, John in that prologue says, From his Fullness, talking about Jesus, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. He doesn't just say, from his fullness, we have all received grace. Because grace is enough. But John says we received grace upon grace. The abundance of grace for us. And this miracle speaks to that abundance. Blessing upon blessing, joy upon joy, grace upon grace. Our God is not a God that simply gives us just enough. But he's abundant with us. Not a little bit of joy, but a lot of joy. Not a little bit of grace, but a lot of grace. Surely if we look into our lives, we could testify to that fact. Can you testify to grace upon grace? And joy upon joy. Can you? So the question I want to leave with us today is this. How do we become so doer? How do we become such a doer people? I couldn't think of another word. But when I was writing this, I was like, that's, that's the word that I need to use. And I still said to Gordon, what is this word? <laughs> what is it? And I said to him, is it an Afrikaans word? I can't place its meaning and that kind of thing. And, and, and Gordon said to me, it's not an Afrikaans word. He said, isn't it Scottish? It is. And then I went to my Google and I said, I didn't even know how to spell it. Put a few different spellings in there and then it popped up. And it is. It comes from the Gaelic word D-U-R with a little 
not a cuppy, but a little, a little ticky on top of, on top of the you, you, to say door. So I want to ask us this morning, how do we become such a door people? Said in an Afrikaans accent. <laughs> what does door mean? How do we become such a sullen people? How do we become such a dull people? Grim or sour? We've just talked about how God, through Jesus, at a wedding, at a celebration, at a party, changes this abundance amount of water into wine so that the people can continue to have their party and celebrate he facilitates that celebration he gives us this amazing quality of wine we talk about how we have grace upon grace in our lives joy upon joy in our lives yet our faces and our lives Communicate this door, seriousness. We become so serious. I wonder if, if God wanted us to be so serious, to take things seriously, you know, to have a relationship with Him, to take that seriously. But out of that relationship, to be able to have joy, a joy. Okay, now think of it like this. What kind of advert do you think you are for Christianity? Do you look like you're having fun? I can't see your faces because you're all behind the mask. But I think it is worth asking that question. If God has lavished grace upon grace, joy upon joy, just in this example, and we can testify to it in our lives, if we were being honest when I asked you and you said yes, if you were being honest, then how come that doesn't exude into other parts of our lives? The joy, the grace, the love, the celebration, the fun, the extravagance. And so really, I want us to be able to come back to this wedding through the year and for you to be able to ask yourself, do I look like I'm living the joyful life? The grace upon grace, the freedom the light-heartedness. Have our burdens been lifted from us? Have our burdens been shared with the Lord? Have we trusted Him in order that we can be free to be joyful? And not just joyful, but as I said, extravagantly joyful. To have extravagant joy. That's my challenge for your 2022 is to find ways to be excited and joyful about this relationship we have with God and for all that he has given us. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to sing about that joy about all the things that we have to sing to it for yourself. We do. <laughs> we do. Okay? About listen to the words as you sing them. Let them permeate you as you listen to them. Impact you. Oh, uh-huh.
Savior shall my heart rejoice. Thou art my soul, the greatness of His name. soul unnumbered blessings that's us and with that we move into a time of the offering as we listen to these words as they call forth the offering our God blesses us with extravagance and abundance grateful for all that we have been given let us present our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. For those of you who continue to support this ministry here at St. Giles, we are grateful and joyful at each of those gifts. If you would like to make a physical donation this morning to the work and a tithe to the work that is being done here, please feel free to pop those into the wooden plates on your way out. Come, let us pray. Just as Jesus turned gallons of water into wine, we too know God's extravagant blessings in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would take these gifts today and bless them, that others may know your abundance and live whole and healthy lives in you. Well, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, we take a moment and we pray our prayers for the people as we remember those both near and far who are in need of your prayers. We pray for ourselves, we pray for our families, our communities and for our nations at this time. Come, let us pray. God, our strength and our refuge Shelter us from life's storms, from pandemic pain, from heartache and loss. Strengthen us to withstand the worry, the exhausting but necessary work, the temptations to stray from you towards idols who only offer fleeting comfort. Hold us close like a mother hen who covers her chicks with her wing, so we can know we are yours. Feel your steady presence and know your peace. God, you are in the midst of our city, in our nations, and in this kingdom. Lord, help us to know your presence among us. Comfort us with the strength of your guidance in a world experiencing so much pain and upheaval. 
May our world leaders walk humbly and practice faithful discernment, surrounding themselves with honest truth-tellers who will hold them to your ethic of love and justice. Come, let us behold the works of God. Let us be still and know our God. God, help us to be still. Help us to forget about the work still left undone, the chores piling up, the deadlines approaching. Help us to rest in you and in your presence. Help us to behold you and to belong to you. We cannot continue without the rest you provide. Help us to embrace stillness as your great gift. And let us join together as we pray the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, we come to the conclusion of our service, and we pray that this has been an affirming time, a time in which you have met with the Lord, and that you have drawn close to him. Receive this blessing. God's grace is extravagant and abundant. Know this grace in your life. Share this grace with others today and every day. And may our God, our creator, redeemer and sustainer bless you today and forevermore. Amen.